This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Morning, good morning, everybody. You're live here with Dr. Jeff Werber, your host for the next 30 minutes here on Pet Life Radio's Ask the Best with Dr. Jeff and here on Instagram Live. And uh, here for you, here for your pets. Easy to get a hold of me here for Instagram Live. You can just go ahead. I'm waving to you. You can just ask away. Hopefully, we'll get some good questions. And otherwise, if you're here on Pet Life Radio, all you have to do is toll free 877 385 8882. Once again, 877 385 8882. And I'd like to hear from you, any questions you may have. Now is the time to ask. Now it's free advice. Hopefully, it'll be good advice. <laughs> I can't promise, but I'll do my best. And uh, anyway, off this week, and I'll be seeing Mark, our producer. We're going to the GPE, Global Pet Expo, probably the largest pet industry trade show in the country. And it is three days in Orlando, and uh, hopefully it'll be packed. It really is. I mean, I remember it from last year. It was amazing. I'm going to be doing some work, working with a couple of the companies there. And um, we're going to be cruising, going around the show, talking to a lot of companies and seeing, uh, hopefully, we'll even get some sponsors for our show here on Pet Life Radio as Mark is shaking his head. Yes. Boy, do we need that. Anyway, what else can I tell you? So otherwise, oh, um, happy St. Patty's Day. Um, yes, JB, <laughs> nice, nice to hear from you. Good seeing you as well. So anyway, ask away. So I had an interesting week. Uh, first of all, there were some things I wanted to talk about. We didn't get a chance to talk about last week. Towards the end of the show, I like talking about, you know, kind of benefits of pet parenting. There are a number of really good benefits to pet parenting. And there are studies showing this is really cool. Kids that grow up with pets actually seem to develop more responsibility, obviously, because they're asked to help with the pets and feeding and walking, et cetera. Check this out. For those of you parents that want smart kids, maybe that, hey, Beth, maybe that's why we're so smart, right? Because we grew up with dogs. We never, in my family, we never did not have dogs. We actually were born into a home with pets. Parents already had pets. For my kids, I had pets when my kids were born. And now my grandkids, they are all growing up in homes that already have pets. So they do not know what it's like not to have pets, which is really great. But better grades in school score at least five points higher on IQ test. So actually, I don't know how it does it. Does it bleed off the smarter because the dog is smarter than we are and it bleeds off into us? I don't know, but they say that kids growing up with pets score higher on IQ tests, average of five points higher. So I think that's pretty cool. So uh, the solution for those of you who having kids, make sure that the kids are growing up in households with pets. That is really important. And um, I think it also, it just helps them focus more. It does. It's great. Okay. First good question from Shigam. How often should dog's teeth be cleaned and how do I know it's time? Great question. So typically we usually say that dogs and cats over the age of three already develop some sort of what we call periodontal disease. So what you're going to notice if you look, and it's really hard to tell because incisors and the fangs usually don't start showing signs until the mouth is in worse shape. So the best thing to do is pull the cheek way back and you want to check out the premolars and the molars. Those are the ones that are going to accumulate the most plaque, which I know we talked about this before. One might ask, well, God, that doesn't make sense because if those are the teeth that are used for chewing, why isn't the, especially dry food, why is the dry food, why isn't it taking care of that plaque? Why are we seeing plaque? And the answer is very simple, because the plaque on the teeth is what's left over from food. So clearly, teeth that are being used for chewing are the ones that are going to have the most plaque. Now, over time, short amount of time, because the saliva in the mouth and bacteria in the mouth, that plaque turns into tartar or calculus. That cannot be removed by brushing. So you don't have a huge window of opportunity here to brush away the plaque, which can be brushed away, which is why it's so critical that you know the vet dentist will tell you your pet's teeth, as ours, should be brushed every single day. Now, could you do it every other day? Yeah, you probably could. But what you don't want to do is do it once a week because it takes less time than that for that plaque, that film, to actually accumulate enough saliva and enough ba the bacteria in the mouth and it's going to convert that plaque into tartar or calculus. Now, why is it those back teeth? Well, of course, two reasons. Number one, 
because those are the ones that are used to chewing. They're going to have more plaque. These teeth aren't going to have much plaque. This teeth are not going to have the client. Dogs don't tear for their teeth, for their food anymore. Dogs aren't cutting for their food. They chew. We put make it so easy for them. All they got to do is stick in their mouth and chew it. So they're using the premolars and molars, the chew teeth. And the salivary ducts empty into the mouth right over those teeth. So the saliva is greatest there, which is, of course, why those are the teeth that get most of the tartar. So how do you know? All you have to do is lift that gum. When you see that cakey, light brownish kind of accumulation on the teeth, that is the tartar calculus. Now, if you can't pick it away with your finger, then you know it needs the cleaning. So typically, by the time they're three or four, they're going to need some degree of professional cleaning. And by the time they're, once they're, once you start doing it, it's probably every year. Now, these very, very small dogs, like we see the Maltese, the Yorkies, the little teeny poodles, for some reason, these very small dogs, they, as older dogs, I'm talking 10, 11, 12, they probably need to have their teeth cleaned twice a year. They accumulate a lot, a lot of tartar. So there you have it. And um, it's really important to stay on top of it. As we discussed before, the benefits of brushing are great, especially when it comes to stopping the spread of the oral bacteria because of severe gum disease. The bleeding is causing a problem. There's bacteria in the mouth now enter the bloodstream. They don't just stay in the mouth. And they seem to colonize heart valves, glomerulonephritis, which is the glomerulus, the infiltration system of the kidney. And that's when we have a lot of these really big problems. So I'm not going to say don't not brushing teeth, not getting dog's teeth clean can be deadly, but in a kind of a roundabout way, indirectly, it can because it causes other diseases in key organs like the kidneys and the heart. So there you have it. I had some really interesting cases this week. I don't know if you follow on, well, you probably hear my Instagram, but I will tell you that's so interesting. So I get a case. This, this was a great case. I don't know if, it's, if it, we posted it yet, but it's going to be posted. These are the cases that I, as a veterinarian, I think most vets look forward to. And we, look, I always say, the truth is that most of our patients are going to get well in spite of us, not necessarily because of us. And then every now and then you get a case that it is because of us. Now, typically our job is to provide support, give it time, maybe keep rehydrating if necessary, whatever the case may be, the right medication to stop the vomiting. So get you. But I mean, these things, it's not like we actually saved a life today. We're putting them on the right track. We're allowing the body to do what it does well, and that is to heal itself. And that's the amazing thing about the body. Same thing with us. But every now and again, we get a case that is beyond just stabilizing. It is beyond just supporting the body so the body can do what it does. These are really cool cases. So here's the story. This dog had a, a vestibular insult, it's called. So that means, you know, many of you have had this with your dogs. We've had it. I remember our white German Shepherd, Sheba, growing up, had this. And their, their world kind of gets cockeyed. So their equilibrium is totally off. And they're circling. Their head is tilted. They're circling to the side. The head is tilted typically. And if you look at their eyes, you dead say you grab by the cheeks and stare at the eyes. Their eyes are flickering back and forth super fast. And that is called nystagmus. And it's all indicating a vestibular insult. We call it IVD, idiopathic vestibular insult, because, you know, we don't know, it's idiopathic vestibular disease, and we don't know why it happens, that we, thus we call it idiopathic. We often joke that we're a bunch of idiots, we can't figure it out. Idiopathic, it just happens. Now, and it usually resolves, but this was a 13-year-old dog, and uh, maybe a little, little old, uh, not really, but the emergency clinic, they took it to, to be a little bit more thorough, and I don't blame them. So they hadn't had a test in a while, they did a blood test, and they did an x-ray, and they saw something that looked unusual on the spleen. So they took the ultrasound and took a look at it, all right, and uh, found a, um, a, a mass. So they, uh, we, took the, we took the dog in. We set up the surgery. Now, interestingly, I had never met this guy. that We met because of two of his friends happened to mention me, and uh, they quoted him some astronomical price for the, the, the splenectomy, and, and that was it. So comes in, and sure enough, we uh, did the splenectomy. This was a tumor. And interestingly, it may not surprise me if this comes back as one of the two non-malignant possibilities. Most of these, and I'm going to get to you. The, 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 that, this was on, I did this on Friday morning. The one that was 
really bad. Uh, we did Monday. I had two in one week, which is crazy. But the beauty of, of these surgeries is that if we didn't do the surgery and this tumor happened to burst, this dog would probably bleed out. And that's when I could say we actually saved a life. And it was really, really great tumor, uh, great surgery. The dog did well, sent it home. So we're obviously, we're going to wait for the biopsy. Now, Mondays was even a different story. But also, in a sense, we call this an incidental finding. When you can do something that the animal didn't come in for, and what you found was way worse than what they came in for, even potentially deadly, that's when it's like, this is why I went to school. This is what I live for, is to, to actually make a difference. So these hands actually saved an animal's life. It's the best. So this was the dog came in, also an older dog, and it came in for minor things. And we had, you know, it started with a dental. It needed a dental. There's a really good reason why you want to stay on top of things. Just when you have a dog coming in for dentistry, what are you going to do first? You got to do some blood work. That's important. And you want to do an exam. So we, dentistry, we had a little two eyelid masses that were very easy. Again, not deadly. The teeth, not deadly. And then a little fatty lipoma, a little fatty tumor. Again, not deadly. This was routine. It was routine. We wanted to get it done because it was an older dog. And how many more opportunities do we have to anesthetize an older, older, large breed dog? So we figured, you know what? This is it. We're going to do it all, get these teeth clean, take the masses off, and hopefully he'll live happily ever after. Well, he's on his back. The last swing we did was that little fatty tumor on the ventral chest. That's the lower part. That means he's on his back. And when he's on his back, I'm noticing a, a bulge in his abdomen. I think that's weird. So I, I feel it and I can move it around. I'm taking off a lipoma here. I thought, you know, maybe this is a lipoma, but huge in between the skin and the body wall. So I call the owner. I said, have you ever noticed this thing? And he goes, no. I said, well, I don't know what it is. It might be a lipoma. It's pretty large. It's movable. I really think we should, well, look, he's already under anesthesia. Let's take advantage of it. Let's, let's do this too, because this is a big one. This could be an issue later on. Okay. Get permission. So we prep because we weren't prepping back down there. So we prepped the area, um, put them, we move into from our, our minor surgical suite with a dental suite into the major surgical suite. And we draped up and I'm looking at this thing. This is huge. So I'm cutting, of course, cutting through the, the skin, hoping, hoping that this is going to be just a fatty tumor between where I thought it was. And I'm looking, there is no big tumor there. And I yet, I still feel it. I'm saying, oh, cow, this is inside the belly. So now we cut through the body wall. And what do I see? I see a mass of just momentum circling around something. And it was, it, it was like a basketball. Actually, heavier than a basketball. Six pounds of tumor on a spleen. And you can only see a little teeny part of that spleen normal left. The whole thing was tumor. How this dog was running around and doing his thing is beyond me. It's amazing. So anyway, we sure enough, we take the tumor out. It's, you should check on uh, Instagram. It really is cool. And um, anyway, yep, took this huge tumor out. Dog did great through the surgery. We're going to set that. This one, this is going to come back in angiosarcoma. It is. Um, if it doesn't, I'd be shocked. But at least it didn't burst. At least he didn't bleed out. And uh, she, and she is going to have a, a whatever, however long it would be before this thing, if it is the hemangiosarcoma metastasizes to the lungs, to the liver, which they often do, but she's an older dog anyway. See so if she makes it a year 14. Hey, that's great. So anyway, these are the cases really that we as veterinarians live for, where we can actually make such a difference. You come in, had we not done this, had, had, had I, first of all, had we not done that little fatty tumor, because you really couldn't tell when the dog is standing because it was a big dog, the belly, unless you're palpating, which the owners don't do, um, you would not, we would not have known. So anyway, one of those lucky, lucky ones. So get your questions ready because I'm seeing a lot of waving guys. No questions today. That is highly unlike you. We usually have lots of good questions. So we're going to break here for a commercial over on Pet Life Radio. And then when I come back, I'm expecting questions. If not, as you know, I got plenty to talk about. Be right back after these words, not go. Take a bite out of your competition. 
Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There is no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, TuneIn, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Well, we're back. We're back here live. Have, I'm answering a question, and we're talking about this because it was a question that came into me this week over on Instagram about raw diets. What do I think about raw diets? And most veterinarians, as you'll probably know, are against raw diets, and for good reason. The pathogens, salmonella, E. coli, Campylobacter, listeria, these are problems we get with raw food. And the modern day domesticated dogs are not like their predecessors. They are not able to handle it. So we need to do it. And of course, we want to do it in a way that we don't destroy the vitamins and the minerals. That's why most commercial diets, after they do some sort of heat pasteurization to kill those bacteria, they then add back in those vitamins and minerals. So you're not really losing anything, but if it makes you feel better, foods that use HPP, high pressure pasteurization, or freeze dried is another way to kill off those bacteria. Sometimes flash freezing would do it too. So just to, to go to the market, think about this. If you eat sushi, and I love sushi, I'm not going to just buy a hunk of salmon or tuna and eat it raw. It needs to be, as you call it, sushi grade. And there's a, a difference because these are the way they're processed and caught and tested. They don't have the bacteria that are dangerous, and that's why they use them. So unless you're going to get meat and you're going to culture it before you feed it to your dog and spend a couple hundred dollars, which I don't recommend, look for something that uses HPP or high-pressure pasteurization or high-pressure processing or freeze-dried, and then it will be safer. So um, anyway, this, let's talk about first heat. That's a really cool question because you know you learn a lot of things along the way. Go back many years, like, oh my God, 40, uh, scary, uh, more than that, 45, 50, when I was in Davis, 50 years ago. And there was a gal on campus, Autumn Davidson, who she used to have her two beautiful yellow labs. And I had my magnificent black lab, Thor. And we kind of met through our Labradors and I would see her walk on campus and we became kind of friends. Our dogs became friends. And that was it. I graduated. And that was it. I, now I'm in vet school years later. And who do I see coming into vet school? Autumn Davidson. I did not, I didn't know she was pre vet. We never even talked about that. So, what happened was she became a board certified. She went on to do residency in reproductive medicine and became a specialist. So, we were talking about exactly this this first heat. Is there truly such a thing as a silent heat? But by the time this dog was 10 or 11 months and we didn't see a seat, we used to say, oh, it must have just had a silent heat. And she said, in many cases, especially larger breeds, they may not get their first heat till they're a year or 13 or 14 months. I mean, there is such a thing as silent heat, but it, maybe not silent. It's just, you, you may not notice it. You may just notice the swelling of the vulva. You may not see any bleeding because there may not be a lot of bleeding. It might be a couple of drops with your urine and, and you don't even see that. So if the dog read the textbook, then we're looking at heat. The first heat should come around seven months of age and then every seven months thereafter. But I would tell you many, many dogs. And now what's so interesting is because we don't want to spay until after their first heat. We want them to have at least one heat. All of a sudden, the dog is 11 months and they still haven't had it. Do they not have it or do they have it? We just missed it. So if it's a large breed, I'd wait a little bit. If they hit 13 months, then I would, I would definitely spay anyway. Because if they did have it at seven as a silent heat that wasn't recognized, then by 14 months, seven months later, they're going to have another one. We don't want them to have that second heat. So then I would say they're at least mature enough to go ahead and fix them. You'd have to be looking for it to make sure that if you see a swollen vulva, a little bit of blood, because often that first heat is not as aggressive, all right, may not be as noticed as the next, the subsequent heats. So great, great question. If you are doing this because you want to avoid other things like that bone cancer in a large dog, I'd say... By, by 13 months, just have her fixed anyway, just to be safe. Congestive heart failure and its prognosis. So 
Congestive heart failure, it's common only because the left-sided heart disease is more common than right-sided heart disease. And when the left side, when the valves, the mitral valves stop functioning well, and there is backflow of blood through those leaky valves, the new blood coming in, there's no room for it because the ventricle, when it contracted, ideally to send blood through the aorta into the rest of the body, much of that blood came shooting back through into the atrium from these leaky valves that didn't seal. Now the next heartbeat from the right side of the heart, just having gone through the lungs, aerate oxygenated blood, trying to go into the left atrium, now is can't because there's too much blood in there already. The backflow from the prior beat on the left side. So what happens? That blood gets backed up, backed up. Now, where did it just come from? It just came from the lungs. So where is it going to go? Back in the lungs. And that means congestive heart failure. So these are the dogs that do a lot of coughing. You'll see a moist cough. If you take x-rays, you'll see a lot of congestion in the lungs. And uh, again, the key to heart disease is early diagnosis. So when you have any question, then you should have your pet evaluated. If there's coughing, you don't see much on x-ray, but you hear a murmur. If you hear a murmur and your dog is coughing, you may not see anything on x-ray yet. It is very important to get an echocardiogram. That's an ultrasound of the heart. And that's where you can actually make a diagnosis for real because you can, pressures can be measured coming in and out of the heart. You can see backflow. You can see a mixture of oxygenated and non-oxygenated blood coming in. So it really does help you make a better, stronger diagnosis. Now, when the right side fails, then you get a backflow of blood coming from the body, right? The vena cava going into the heart. So now you get a backflow. The, that blood pretty much just came from the liver. And then you start getting buildup of fluid in the belly called ascites, either coming from the failed heart, coming from a congested liver. And um, again, that's when the belly fills up with fluid. It's a, usually a transudate or a modified transudate. Again, that is indicative of either a heart problem or a liver disease. So the early diagnosis is key. Now, having said all that, the current feeling is that even with early diagnosis, with great treatment, the progression of the disease continues. You can deal with it. You can up doses. You can add certain drugs. I mean, we have pemobendin. We have Lasix. We have benazapril, we have enalapril, we have spironolactone, we have for the, treating the cough itself, Hycodan, diltiazem. I mean, there are all these medications that help deal with the symptoms, but the problem is even with all that doing everything right, there's going to be progression. Not necessarily a cure. The best we can do is treat the symptoms, handle them, slow the process, but we can't necessarily eradicate the process. And ultimately, it is believed that this disease is going gonna, is gonna to get it. I know and also one thing, if you have an animal that has heart disease and is on any of these medications based on your veterinarian or ideally a veterinary cardiologist, which I highly recommend, have them do the echo, prescribe based on the results of the echocardiogram, the correct drugs. Then you know, just understand that these drugs are going to probably be, have to be continued forever. Don't take that first 30 or 60 days and finish and say, okay, I guess I'm done because the dog's doing much better. No, you need to do follow-ups. Echoes probably every six months, and you need to stay on medication. I had a case where the owners were, it was not clear, it was referred to me that no, you don't stop just because the animal's doing better and just because you ran out of meds. You got to go back, more evaluation, and make sure, and you might even, if anything, need to add more meds. So it's really smart to stay on top of it because the disease will progress. Uh, okay, there was a question here about is there blood work? to tell if it's okay to spay. The, the blood work will only tell you that it's okay to have anesthesia. There's no, unless you want to do, like there's no way to tell unless you are able to get a vaginal cytology during a posed or suspected heat. That can tell you whether the dog is in estrus or not. There will be nothing on the blood. So all the blood's going to tell you, yep, good candidate for surgery. Hopefully at, at these young ages, the dog's going to be fine and should have her surgery, but understand that there's no blood test, unfortunately. Now, there are some tests that can do like a rise in progesterone. Again, we use tests if we suspect that there is a, an ovarian remnant left behind. Could that mean the dog might be in season? 
there are certain things we could do blood levels, but you have to catch it at the right moment. If there was and you didn't get it at the right time, it's going to be normal. So you have to basically go by age. If you've obviously you're lucky enough to see that first heat, then there you have it. But I would say by 13 or, or you know, look, because if you don't want to miss it, you don't want them to have that second heat. And if you wait to 14 months, then there's a good chance if they did have a heat that's kind of more of a silent heat or a simple heat, an easier heat that you missed on the first one, here they go, get the second heat at 14 months. It's the second, not the first. Then you lost some benefits when it comes to mammary cancer. All right. Oh, let me end with this one because I thought this was cute. So the dogs and cats dream. And now those of us that have dogs and cats, we know they do. Why? Because you have a dog and you watch their feet and their feet are going. Obviously, they are in REM, rapid eye movement sleep, just like most mammals have some degree of REM. Other species are not so sure of. It's been studied in fish. It's been studied in birds, reptiles. Do they have actually a REM sleep? Do they dream? Now, what are they dreaming about? Well, cats probably dreaming about you know stalking and then chasing a prey. Dogs dreaming about play, food. If you have a Labrador, trust me, they're dreaming about food because they're, <laughs> they can't wait to eat their next meal. So they're dreaming about food. What's the next meal going to be there? And they also dream about being with their parents, with you. They dream about that. It's great, but these studies were done. And one study, this is done in France years ago. There was a neurologist. He was studying pets. And there's a part of the brain he felt was the part that suppresses movement during a dream. And it's called the pons. So he did was he obliterated or did something to block the nerves of the pons leading to the rest of the brain, P-O-N-S, pons. And these animals in their dreams were full-blown getting up and running, almost like sleepwalking. So, and that might have been his premise. You know, what? how do people get up and start doing something in their dream? Maybe it was a suppression of the pons. So anyway, I thought that was really, really cool. So yes, they do dream. And, uh, you know, it's good to, uh, good to, well, as I said, we've seen it. I've seen it, my dogs, a lot. They vocalize or they're barking or they're growling like a, a deep, low growl. You know, they're dreaming. He's barking at somebody. He's barking at the intruder. Now, if he was awake and doing it, you better check your alarm system and get your gun, maybe. Who knows? But uh, no, this is, I think it's fascinating. The fact that it's been studied and what they dream about, they feel, I think that's pretty cool too. All right. Anyway, time to go. I will be here next Sunday. I'm going to be leaving Tuesday afternoon for the Global Pet Expo. We'll be there Wednesday, Thursday, back Friday morning, landing, I don't know, eight something and going straight to the office. But uh, next Sunday, we'll be here and looking forward to it. If you have any questions during the week, please get a hold of me right here. Just ask them on my IG Live on Pet Life Radio, send it Pet Life Radio, and we will answer your questions. And uh, it's great to have you as guests. And again, on Pet Life Radio, you know, you can join me here live with your pet. And knowing from telemedicine, uh, which we do at AirVet, it would be really, really cool because you'll see how easy it is, how great it is, how to be able to see you live with your pets and answer questions. Okay, so um, have a great week, everybody. We'll see you next week. And enjoy it. If you're here in Southern California, beautiful day today. It started out really nice. Blue skies, no clouds. Mark, how's it like in Florida? That's really nice in Florida. I'm looking forward because I'm going to be in Orlando. All right. See you next week. Bye-bye. Let's Talk Pets. Every week on demand. Only on PetLifeRadio.com.